So you're thinking about running, but not sure how to take the first step. My name's Brian Patterson, and I'm here to help. And welcome to Brian's Rompod. Welcome back to the podcast and you've been listening to our past episodes. I just wanted to say a very, very big thank you. Don't know if you know that this is my second attempt at doing a podcast. My first was over five years ago. And just to let you know that it was about programming. Anyway, let's move on and talk about today's episode. We are going to go into the weeds of the technical side of running, as promised from last week. So what we're going to talk about is cadence. What does it mean? Is there a right cadence? How can I improve my cadence? And what has been my experience of improving cadence? Also, we're going to talk about intervals. What is the history behind intervals? How will it improve my running? Is it really for me? And I hope to give you a simplified version. If nothing else, it will arm you with the knowledge of why it could be useful. As someone once said, knowledge is a very powerful thing. So let's move on. What is cadence? Put simply, cadence, also known as stride rate, is the number of steps a runner takes per minute. It's the most common metric used to measure the running form and remains important for several reasons. For starters, the shorter your stride length and the quicker your stride rate, the faster and better you run. If you have a low cadence, you're likely also to have a long stride. Runners who overstride tend to lock their knees and slam their heels to the ground on every step. This slows you down and it creates a very choppy, bouncy gait and puts extra pressure on the muscles and bones, making you more susceptible to injury. But increasing your cadence, you're doing more than moving your feet faster. You're changing the positioning of where your foot lands rather than having your foot land in front of your hips with a <clears throat> higher cadence with a higher cadence it lands underneath you in, in your center of gravity this naturally decreases your stride length and increases your turnover which means you're wasting less energy moving up and down from the ground to the air and vice versa rather your body is focused on moving forward making it faster now when you increase your cadence, you also limit the force with which your body hits the ground. If you have a low cadence, you're spending more time up in the air, displacing your body mass, so you hit the ground much harder than you had with a high cadence. The more steps you take per minute, the less time you spend in the air, equaling a softer impact on landing. Louise Damon, in her article that cadence can also be used as a marker of fatigue, typically as runners begin to tire, they lose form and their cadence decreases. This, along with information about pace and even heart rate, can be useful in determining if there's a point in your run when you can no longer sustain your target pace. You can then use this information to make some adjustments to your training. Now, what's, how do we find the current or optimal running cadence? For many years, running experts encourage runners to increase their stride rate to 180 strides per minute to achieve the optimal running economy. This was based on the legendary running coach Jack Daniels' analysis of the strides of elite distance runners at the 1984 Olympics. He found the fastest and most efficient runners had a cadence of at least 180 strides per minute, with some runners reaching as high as 200. And aside who is Jack Daniels? Well, he does not own a famous whiskey company. He's an American running coach and physiologist whose training philosophy was to divide running performance into six components. Daniels argues that each of these components requires a specific training intensity to improve. Now, I know that with these six different components, some of them may seem like gobbledygook, 
But don't worry, we will go over these in, in future episodes and give a bit of a clearer understanding. For instance, the cardiovascular system, your heart and lungs, specifically the body's ability to transport oxygen. Second, the running muscles, ability to use the oxygen. Third, the lactate threshold, the ability to cope with and minimise the lactic acid in the blood. Then four, the VO2 max, uh, which was the maximum oxygen uptake capacity. Then speed, for example, leg turnover. And then the running economy, the efficiency of the running movement. So these are the different components which were part of his coaching philosophy. Anyway, back to cadence. But more recent studies have shown cadence is not one size fits all. Your optimum cadence depends on several factors, including your height, weight and running ability. Cadence also varies depending on the type of run you're doing. A training or a long run cadence will be slower than speed work or racing cadence. So you should determine your base cadence for your different types of paces. Easy, normal, tempo, marathon. To do this, find a smooth, flat surface, a track or a long stretch of road works perfectly. From there, you have two options to measuring your cadence. You can either use a fitness, any fitness watch, to automatically calculate your cadence. No math or counting required by just running as much or as little as you like. For instance, my base is 160-ish SPM, which is quite slow. So I've basically need to be looking to improve that cadence or alternatively um, if you don't have a fitness watch you could count your steps as you run you don't need to count both feet touching the ground for the entire minute just count the number of times your right foot hits the ground in 30 seconds and then multiply that by four repeat this a few times to ensure the accuracy note you're more likely to run naturally than less likely to adjust your cadence, whether consciously or not, when you run with a fitness watch than when you're concentrating on counting your steps. It's similar to breathing. Once you start focusing on it, it's all you can think about. So how do we go increasing your running cadence? Note that there are a number uh, of number you can you can work on to increase your steps per minute and different types of runs. So simply by take one of your base steps per minute and increase that by 5 to 10% to find your personal goal cadence. For example, if your base running cadence is 162 SPM, your goal cadence should be between 170 to 178 SPM. Even if it's not as fast as the elites, this small increase will still improve your running performance and reduce your chance of injury. And it will seem a little bit odd initially. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that when I was trying a few runs to increase my cadence. And like anything with running, it's crucial you take it slow. You can't increase your cadence overnight. And if you try, you'll likely get injured. It can take up to two months for your body to adapt to a faster cadence and for it to feel normal. Don't increase your cadence for your entire run. Increase your cadence either by time, maybe a minute fast, and then maybe five minutes slow, and then a minute fast, and then sort of build build on that or you can do it by distance so you could do um, i know on my fitness watch you can do markers by distance so let's say 400 meters at a higher cadence and then 400 meters at a slower cadence so that's just one example once that starts feeling like second nature increase it slightly again until you reach your personal call cadence now here's some tips um, to increase your steps. So one of the most old school yet effective ways to increase your cadence is by using a metronome, a device that produces a set number of beats or clicks per minute. You can get sums which you, if you kind of put a uh, metronome under a cap or something like that, and um, 
it will if you set it to maybe 170 beats per minute then um, you just run to the every time you hear the uh, the beats uh, the only problem I have with that is that obviously if you're running outside then you have to stop at traffic lights or when you're going pedestrian crossings that kind of thing and you can that can take your stride out from that rhythm so um or you can use um music for instance so there are um fantastic playlists on either spotify or apple music which will uh you can use called i think there's one called 180 beats per minute playlist and it's got the beats of this of the songs are 180 beats per minute obviously um Second tip would be to focus on smaller steps, not on running faster. Speed will come naturally as you increase your cadence. For now, think baby steps, literally. Um, running on a treadmill uh, to increase your cadence is uh, uh, another good thing to do if you can, if you're a member of a gym. A treadmill is a, is a great place to practice as you can set the pace. Track your progress in real time with a sport watch. Number three, uh, remember that it's important not to increase your SPM too much too soon and uh, and that will help you stay on track. Do workouts geared specifically for faster turf turnover. So workouts like going downhill sprints means they're far, that you will, uh, without doubt, have a faster leg turnover. Um just make sure that it, it is safe when you're going downhill. You don't want to be tripping up. And also number five, uh, practice plyometrics. So plyometrics are explosive exercises such as jumps, bounds and hops that are designed to teach you to produce more force with minimal ground contact time. When running, this ultimately translates to a faster turnover. Try introducing a small amount of plyometric work after an easy run once or twice a week. Runners of all abilities, uh, beginning to advance, can benefit from working on their cadence. While adjusting your stride may feel a little awkward and unnatural at first, if you stick with it, you'll be on your way to becoming a faster, less injury-prone runner. Now, my experience has been that um, I tried to do a six kilometer run at a higher cadence and I just couldn't keep up. Um, and I found it really odd uh, trying to have these shorter steps. So I thought the next time would be to do uh, an interval run. Um, and I'll go more into intervals and kind of the history of intervals in the, in the next section of this podcast. Um, and again, it, it is very, very odd to try and get used to it, to, to take those shorter steps. And it just seems as if you're not running properly. But uh, like I said, um, I think it's just something that you're just going to have to get used to. Uh, and if you know the reasons why, um, then that will help you um, sort of focus on doing the right thing in terms of getting your uh, SPM um, faster in uh, in time. So um, you can monitor this. Um, um, I'm, I don't know if you've heard of Strava. Uh, basically, it's a web-based uh, fitness um, app. Um, they also have apps on iOS and also Garmin and Garmin and I'm sure the Google fitness watches and you can track your uh, strides per minute in uh, uh, in the app itself on the web based app itself so let's say if you were doing an interval then you can say within those intervals then you can monitor as to whether you kept up with a higher stride rate um, because it's really hard to do it no one's telling you while you're doing it. Um, you know, the watch kind of, you can sort of gauge a range, but um, when you download your uh, stats um, onto oops, either Strava or any of the other fitness-based apps, then um, uh, they can give you a much, much more detailed information if you're keeping 
uh, if your target is uh, to increase your uh, strides per minute. Anyway, enough about my experience there. But as I said, um, good tips are run to a beat, use uh, playlists, focus on smaller steps, track your progress in real time with a sports watch, or maybe look on to websites like Strava. Do workouts gear specifically to faster turbo, so just do a interval run and then maybe do uh, uh, ply, practice plyometrics. Now let's look into intervals. Um, what's the training history? The simple reason why we run intervals is it allows the runner to hit a specific pace for uh, a longer amount of time than would be spent in that zone if you just ran a continuous run. So it means that you're able to have a higher intensity of a workout. Um, so now, way back in the day, athletes didn't have the physiological advantage of knowledge to know as to what these zones were or as to the science. It wasn't advanced enough yet, but through trial and error, athletes decided that interval training was better than running flat out for a distance. So for instance, I do a bit of a warm up and then by doing intervals now on a very simple example here would be to run very fast for two minutes and then uh, go slowly for two minutes then if you did this six times you will in effect when you monitor your heart rate your heart rate would be going a lot higher higher than let's say if you're trying to run continuously for maybe uh three or four kilometers and it means you're getting a lot much better workout um, and there's various things you can do uh, in terms of the intervals as i'll as i'll explain so the reason for the interval training back then was to allow to run to a certain pace for a longer period of time than would have went out to run at a particular distance also it wasn't as taxing to say run 400 meters rest and then 400 meters at a slower um, and then 400 meters again um, fast again as it was to run let's say a, a whole mile and mile and miles um, at a really high intensity as i've explained uh, earlier in and around the as we go back in time, in around the 1910, the Finns devised a more systematic approach to interval training. The credit for this method could be attributed to the Finnish coach, Lauri Perkala, who, again, I've probably completely destroyed his uh, surname. Uh, this training can be seen in the two uh, greatest distance runners of their time, Paavo Numeri and Heinz Kuhlemann. Kuhlemann was the 1912 Olympic gold medalist in the uh, five kilometers, 10 kilometers and 8K cross country race. Unfortunately, he didn't leave a lot of details about his training, but it can be seen in letters written to Pavo Nurmi in 1918 that he should include more training that included alternating fast and slow runs or interval training. One example of the interval training done by Nurmi is that of um, four to uh, seven kilometers with fast speed um, over the last one to two kilometers, finished off by four to five sprints. So most of the training consists of a set of short sprints, about 150 meters at 100 percent, and then a run of considerable, uh, a considerable distance between 600 to 3,000 meters. Anyway, as I, as I said, it's all about increasing the intensity of the workout rather than progressive let's say you've got a 5k run and you're just going all out for it because if anything you're going to uh if i think you're going to get either get injured and it's not from a psychological point of view um it doesn't really motivate you in the mid 1930s a swedish coach named gustav holmer invented a different kind of interval training this would be called fartlek training this fartlek training was a very informal type of training where you vary the speed based on uh, based on the athlete's feel. This means um, you you often run times at alternating fast, slow, fast, medium, medium, slow. Um, it was used by Swedes successfully and made it all the way around the world and is still being used throughout the world today. 
It's amazing the longevity of fart like training. Two notable athletes who use the system was Gunda Haag and Arnie Anderson, who were extremely close to breaking the four minute mile in the pre World War II era. During the same period, the famous coach, German coach Waldemar Gerschler, came up with an interval training method based on heart rates to monitor effort. Emil Zadepek, a very well known um, Olympic athlete, Czech Olympic athlete, his method was a combination of the Gerschler's interval training work, then the emergence of um, of, of the Emil Zadebuk really propelled interval training to the forefront of the main method to prepare the distance a distance runner. Zadebuk helped to bring back the concept of interval training after a brief lull during World War II. Zadebuk's train was a rather simple concept break the runs into shorter bursts so that he could run at an average faster speed. His explanation can be seen can be seen when he said. When I was young, I was too slow. I thought I must learn to run fast by practicing to run far. So I ran 100 metres fast 20 times and then I came back. Slow, 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 people said. Emil, you are crazy. You are training like a sprinter. And why should I be practicing running slow? I already know how to run slow. I want to learn how to run fast. Everyone said, Emil, you're a fool. When I won my first European Championships, they said, Emil, you're a genius. If I run 100 metres 20 times, that is two kilometres and that is no longer a sprint, Emil Zadabek said. Zadabek was one of the best middle, middle distance, middle to long distance runners ever and more importantly was extremely innovative in his training methods. He won gold medals in 1948 at the 10,000 metres and in the 10, and the 10,000 metres, 5,000 metres and marathon in 1952 Olympics. His training methods consisted of running an enormous amount of repetitions on various training, terrain and conditions. He would often times run in heavy army boots to build up strength and resistance. Well, I hope that's given you a little bit of a flavour as to what interval training, uh, history about interval training, and no doubt we will be coming back to this in uh, future episodes. I know it's something that I use quite a bit and I get quite a lot of enjoyment out of. It just varies your training. Um, It means you don't have to just go out the door and just do two or three kilometres or whatever it is you're going out to do but as i said it's really good now tip of the week If you have an Apple Watch or even any other smart running watches, you can set your intervals to help you increase your cadence. For instance, I have set up my Apple my Apple Watch to do an interval session with a 500 meter warm up, with a 400 meter four times 800 meter fast, with a cadence of 165 to 170. Then a rest between the intervals of 400 meters. So if you feel you want to give it a try then go ahead and do that. I'm sure other smart watches do a very similar thing. I'm sure the Garmin's do it. They're very, very advanced. So why not give it a try and just try it in your training? So anyway, anyway, that's it for another episode and looking forward to speaking to you next week with some beginner hints and tips about running. I just want to let you know that you can follow me on X or what was known as Twitter at Brian's Rompod. I have just recently set up a Facebook page which is called Brian's Rompod and I am on Instagram at Brian's Rompod. Also my website is www.brianesrompod.co.uk where you can get show notes or on whatever podcasting app you are listening to the show. Plus all my episodes have chapter markers if you need to get to different segments of the show. Plus leave a review as it will help others find this podcast. Music is Happy Day by Stock Audio, not forgetting artwork by Alice Patterson. Till next week, thanks again for listening. 